item of business, which is a statement by Paul Wheelhouse on unconventional oil and gas. And the Minister will take questions at the end of his statement, so there should be no uh, interventions until then. I would encourage all members who wish to ask a question to press their request to speak buttons now. And I call on Paul Wheelhouse. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, this Government has consistently taken a cautious, evidence-led approach to considering the potential exploitation of unconventional oil and gas in Scotland. As part of this approach, we have ensured stakeholders and the people of Scotland have had the opportunity to participate in the decision-making process in an open, inclusive and transparent way. Indeed, the Scottish Government has now undertaken one of the most far-reaching investigations into unconventional oil and gas of any government, including a four-month public consultation, which concluded in May. Our consultation, Talking Fracking, embodied the Scottish Government's commitment to the full participation of local communities and stakeholders in decisions that matter to them and impact upon them. It has been clear throughout this process there are deeply held and sincere views on all sides of this debate, including in this chamber. Presiding officer, today I wish to update the chamber on the findings of our consultation. I will also set out this government's preferred position on the future of unconventional oil and gas in Scotland, based on the findings of our consultation and the extensive evidence we have collated. As I have previously stated, this preferred position will be brought to this chamber for a full parliamentary debate and vote, and we propose this happens shortly after recess. As with our previous announcement on underground coal gasification on the 6th of October 2016, and in line with our statutory responsibilities, a strategic environmental assessment will be commissioned following the parliamentary vote to assess the impact of the Scottish Government's position prior to its finalisation. Before I update the Chamber on the consultation findings, it's important to set the context for this decision. A policy decision on unconventional oil and gas in Scotland does not exist in isolation. It must be viewed within the context of our longer term ambitions for energy and the environment, manufacturing and the Scottish economy more generally, and of course our climate change responsibilities. The main product from unconventional oil and gas reserves is natural gas, which is our principal source of energy for heating. Shale deposits may also contain natural gas liquids, such as ethane. These important raw materials for our chemical and manufacturing industries are used in a wide range of high value products, including plastics, detergents and clothing. This government recognises that gas will be an important part of Scotland's energy mix for the foreseeable future and access to a secure and affordable supply of energy and raw materials is fundamental to the competitiveness and productivity of the Scottish, Scottish business and industry. A strong and vibrant domestic offshore oil and gas industry can play a positive role in our future energy system and is entirely consistent with encouraging a stable managed transition to a low carbon economy. Achieving our vision for energy is crucial to our efforts to tackle fuel poverty and prevent the damaging effects of climate change as part of the global community's fight to limit global temperature rises to below 2 degrees Celsius whilst pursuing efforts towards 1.5 degrees Celsius. In addition to support for our manufacturing sectors, the programme for government includes a commitment to the introduction of a new climate change bill, which will set even more ambitious targets to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. This government's view is that we have a moral responsibility to tackle climate change and an economic responsibility to prepare Scotland for new low carbon opportunities. Presiding officer, our comprehensive public consultation provided an opportunity for individuals, local communities, industry, academics, and stakeholders to comment on and shape this policy decision. We have today published the full analysis of the consultation responses. The consultation received 60,535 valid responses, the second largest response to a Scottish Government consultation, and a clear validation of our participative approach. Of these responses, 52,110, or 86%, were campaign responses or petitions, and 8,425 or 14% took the form of substantive responses. Of those respondents in Scotland providing a substantive response and a postcode, nearly two thirds, 4,151, lived in one of 13 local authority areas identified as potentially having significant shale, oil and gas reserves or coal bed methane. The consultation was not an opinion poll, that simply wouldn't do justice to the range of issues that need to be discussed and considered. However, it was clear that the overwhelming majority of respondents were opposed to the development of unconventional oil and gas industry in Scotland. Overall, approximately 99% of the responses were opposed to fracking and fewer than 1% were in favour. Those opposed to fracking repeatedly emphasised the potential for significant, long-lasting negative impacts on communities, health, environment and climate, expressed scepticism about the ability of regulation to mitigate negative impacts, and were unconvinced about the value of any economic benefit or the contribution of unconventional oil and gas to Scotland's energy mix. 
Alternative views were received. Some respondents were either supportive of an unconventional oil and gas industry developing in Scotland, or did not feel it was possible to come to a view on the available evidence. Those in favour of an unconventional oil and gas industry emphasised the potential benefits they perceived for the economy, for communities, for the climate, and for Scotland's energy supply, and said that the risks associated with unconventional oil and gas extraction were no greater than those associated with any other industry. They argued that the development of a strong and robust regulatory framework could mitigate any adverse impacts. Presiding officer, reaching a decision on unconventional oil and gas is the culmination of a careful and comprehensive period of evidence gathering. We have not taken the process or the decision lightly. At each stage, we have created opportunities for discourse and debate, and I would hope that everyone in this chamber, regardless of their views on this subject, would acknowledge the opportunities for meaningful participation that we have created. I want to now set out some, of the more, some more of the considerations that have guided my decision. In reviewing the research findings, I have particular concerns over the insufficiency of epidemiological evidence on health impacts highlighted by Health Protection Scotland. I also note the conclusion of the Committee on Climate Change, our advisors on statutory targets, who concluded that unconventional oil and gas extraction in Scotland would make meeting our existing climate change targets more challenging. Indeed, as the committee states in its report, in order to be compatible with the Scottish climate change targets, emissions from production of unconventional oil and gas would require to be offset through reductions in emissions elsewhere in the Scottish economy. And given the scale of the challenge we already face, that would be no easy task. I also note that KPMG concluded in the report on the economic impact of an unconventional oil and gas industry in Scotland that under their central development scenario, just 0.1% annually would on average be added to Scottish GDP should fracking be given the go-ahead. I've also been mindful of the important reality that the potential activity associated with an unconventional oil and gas industry would be co concentrated in and around former coal fields and oil shale fields in the central belt, which are amongst the most densely populated areas of Scotland. Our consultation demonstrated that communities across Scotland, particularly in areas where developments could take place, have yet to be convinced there is a strong enough case of national economic importance when balanced against the risk of disruption they anticipate on matters such as transport impacts, risk of pollution and impacts on their general health and well-being. Presiding officer, while I am sure that an unconventional oil and gas industry would work to the highest environmental and health and safety standards, it is our responsibility as a government to make a decision we believe is in the best interest of the people of this country as a whole. We must be confident that the choices we make will not compromise health and safety or damage the environment in which we live. Having considered this matter in considerable detail, it's also our view that the outcome of the pu our public engagement shows that in those communities which would be most affected, there is no social licence for unconventional oil and gas to be taken forward at this time. And the research we've conducted does not provide a strong enough basis from which to adequately address those communities' concerns. Presiding officer, taking all of this into account and balancing the interests of the environment, our economy, public health and public opinion, I can confirm that the conclusion of the Scottish Government is that we will not support the development of unconventional oil and gas in Scotland. <clears throat> to put this position into immediate effect, uh, we have today written to local authorities across Scotland to make clear that the directions that gave effect to the moratorium will remain in place indefinitely. This action means we will use planning powers to ensure that any unconventional oil and gas applications are considered in line with our position of not supporting unconventional oil and gas. Presiding officer, let me be clear that the action is sufficient to effectively ban the development of unconventional oil and gas extraction in Scotland. The decision I am announcing today means that fracking cannot and will not take place in Scotland. Uh, my comments today relate to the use of planning powers. Of course, this Parliament awaits the transfer of licensing powers promised by the UK Government and legislated for in the Scotland Act 2016. The commencement order for these powers was expected in February this year, but is yet to be progressed by the UK Government. This licensing regime currently takes place under an EU hydrocarbons licensing framework. We are concerned that these powers appear in the list provided by the UK Government of areas where it may reappropriate as a result of Brexit. This would be unacceptable. I have therefore also written today to Secretary of State Greg Clark, setting out our position on the future of unconventional oil and gas in Scotland, to seek assurances that no such power grab will take place and that powers promised will be transferred to the Scottish Parliament as soon as possible. 
However, while this is important, I want to make crystal clear today that using our planning powers in the way I have set out allows us to deliver our position no matter what Westminster decides. Presiding officer, I'm aware there is a proposal for a member's bill on this issue from Claudia Beamish. Uh, the use of planning powers is an effective and indeed much quicker way to deliver our policy objective. And as with our actions on nuclear power stations, legislation is therefore not necessary. Presiding officer, in closing, I acknowledge that Scotland's chemical industry has conveyed strong views on the potential benefits of shale and Scottish industry. I want to be clear that notwithstanding our position on unconventional oil and gas in Scotland, our support for Scotland's industrial base and manufacturing sector is unwavering. Manufacturing and the chemicals industry continue to play a crucial role in the Scottish economy and we understand that a supportive fiscal regime, affordable energy, access to the right skills, a good infrastructure are all essential to future success and that is why this government will continue to support industry in a range of different ways in the months and years to come. At the outset of devolution, one of the principal aims of this parliament was to bring decision making closer to those most affected. That ethos has underpinned our approach to reaching a decision not to support the development of unconventional oil and gas in Scotland. Now, taking full account of the available evidence and strength of public opinion today, my judgment is that Scotland should say no to fracking. This position will be reflected in our finalised energy strategy, which we will publish this December. The next step in this process will be for the Scottish Government to table a motion for debate and allow Parliament to vote on whether or not to support our carefully considered and robust position on unconventional oil and gas. Presiding officer, I want to conclude by thanking everyone who has contributed to this process. It is right that this Government saw expert, independent scientific advice and that we took the time needed to seek the views of the people of Scotland. The people have spoken. Uh, the time has come to move on. Thank you. Thank you. The Minister will now take questions. Question number one, Dean Lockhart. Oh, beg your pardon. Point of order, Neil Findlay. Such an important decision was made by the Cabinet. If that's the case, why did the Cabinet Secretary not make that statement to Parliament and take questions? Is it because the Cabinet Secretary doesn't believe a single word of what's put in that document? Yes, these, these decisions are a matter for the government uh, and an exercise of collective responsibility. They're not a matter for the chair or for parliamentary standing orders. Question number one, Dean Lockhart. Thank you, presiding officer. I thank the minister for advance copy of his statement. So after years of indecision, the SNP has finally made its choice in relation to fracking. And yet again, Scotland's economy is left behind. Time and again, independent assessments have shown the significant benefit that fracking could bring to Scotland's economy. Up to 4.6 billion in additional GVA could be generated by this industry, as well as thousands of highly skilled jobs across Scotland. Yep. This much needed economic boost and these jobs will now be created outside of Scotland, thanks to the SNP. Can the minister therefore explain, first, what estimates has his government made of the economic impact of its decision today? And how many potential high-skilled jobs will no longer be created here in Scotland? And secondly, the Minister said that the government has decided to ban fracking following an evidence-led approach. However, the Scottish Government's own expert scientific panel concluded, and I quote, the technology exists to allow the safe extraction of reserves subject to robust regulation being in place. If this ban on fracking is not based on an economic assessment and is not based on expert evidence on safety, does the Minister agree with leading scientific commentators across Scotland that banning fracking is all about the politics and not about the science? Minister. Uh, well, firstly, can I just say, uh, say, presiding officer, that as the Minister has led the process all the way through the consultation, I'm here to answer for that process. And I think in the point of order, um, in response to... In, in response to uh, Mr Lockhart's point, uh, points that he makes, I would stress a number of things. First of all, that unlike the UK government, which has ploughed ahead with a gung-ho attitude to the development of unconventional oil and gas activities in England, with the consequent upset that it's caused to communities in Lancashire and elsewhere, and has not thought at all about the social licence involved with such a new industry in an area of densely populated England, um, we have taken a responsible view uh, to this uh, development of our approach to unconventional oil and gas. We have listened to scientific evidence. Mr Lockhart says that we don't have evidence of the economic impact. I would direct him to read the KPMG study, which shows quite clearly what uh, a leading uh, economic analyst believes is the economic impact under three different scenarios. And the central scenario, as I set out in my statement just moments ago, it would amount to 
uh, 0.1% of, addi of additional GDP for the Scottish economy, against which many local communities in the 13 local authority areas affected, suggested there would be potentially negative impacts on local industries such as agriculture and tourism. So Mr Lockhart may not want to listen to the people of Scotland in those communities that are most affected by unconventional oil and gas, but this government is listening to people of Scotland in those areas, and we are banning unconventional oil and gas in Scotland as a consequence. Could I urge, urge members to keep their comments and maybe press their request to, to speak buttons if they wish to ask a question. Uh, Claudia Beamish to be followed by Mark Bruskell. Claudia Beamish. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I welcome prior sight of the statement on onshore fracking. Labour has long argued that we do not need another fossil fuel. We need to develop forms of renewable energy with unionised and well-paid jobs. Presiding Officer, let's be clear. This announcement is a result of communities and Labour's pressure and specifically my proposal to change the law, I repeat that, my proposal to change the law to ban fracking in Scotland, which is well developed. Extending the moratorium indefinitely, whilst welcome, is not as strong as a full legal ban and could be overturned at any point at the whim of a future minister. These proposals do not go far enough. They do not offer the protection that my bill would. Will the Minister work with me to ensure a full legal ban to protect communities, the environment and future generations across Scotland? Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, Firstly, can I say that so I do recognise Claudia Beamish has taken a long-standing interest in this issue, and, uh, but I do just say gently to her that we have put in place today, in, in through the measures that I've outlined, uh, an effective immediate ban on uh, unconventional oil and gas activities in Scotland of a similar nature to that which we have put in place for uh, new nuclear power stations. And that is, that is important. We are able to much more expeditiously put into effect uh, control on this activity, uh, which I have done today through, uh, through writing to Greg Clark in respect of uh, the position, setting out position the Scottish Government on unconventional oil and gas and the Chief Planning Officer has written to all 32 local authority directors of planning to update them on the position I have outlined to the Chamber today. I would just say merely to uh, Claudia Beamish, we do not have licensing powers that have, been, that have not yet been transferred to the Scottish Parliament, but the, outline, uh, the approach I have outlined today is, uh, helps us achieve the objective that she seeks, which is to control this activity. And Richard Dixon from Friends of the Earth has already tweeted, I understand, to say that this is an upgrading a moratorium to a ban. So uh, if other stakeholders ref are able to understand the impact of this policy, I would encourage Claudia Beamish uh, to support us when the debate comes following recess. Colin, Mark Ruskell to be followed by Lee MacArthur. Mark Ruskell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I welcome this statement to Parliament today? It shows that the Scottish Government has indeed listened to communities, and the Government here has signalled its intention to ban. However, we don't have a ban in front of us. The Scottish Government today has merely extended its current moratorium, a moratorium which is legally shaky and open to challenge by large companies such as INEOS. So when will the Scottish Government introduce a permanent ban by using Scottish planning policy, by using environmental regulations and licensing powers which don't actually require primary legislation. Minister. I apologise, Presiding Officer. I'm, I'm taken aback because I don't think Mark Ruskell, I, I respect him greatly, but I don't think he has listened to what I have said in my statement. We have put in place, using Scottish planning policy, an immediate ban on unconventional oil and gas activities in Scotland. And, and we will seek... We will seek the Parliament's endorsement for that position when we hopefully are able to hold a debate following recess and will seek support of Mark Ruskell and his colleagues and other colleagues across the Chamber for the position we set out. We uh, believe the position we have set out is robust. It is based on an evidence-based approach we have taken throughout. It's, uh, we have listened to all sides and we have concluded in a number of key areas we are unsatisfied uh, based on the, the scientific evidence and indeed the very strong views of communities in the 13 areas affected and more widely in Scotland that this activity should not happen. Uh, I give reassurance that I've made, tried to make crystal clear in my statement this is an effective ban on unconventional oil and gas activities in Scotland and we very much regard it as being a, a robust process that we have gone through. Liam MacArthur to be followed by Angus Macdonald. Liam MacArthur. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Can I thank the Minister for early sight of his statement and confirm the Scottish Liberal Democrats warmly welcome the decision, albeit via the scenic route, effectively to ban fracking in Scotland. Does the Minister agree that while opening up a new front of carbon-based uh, fuels and energy production would do nothing to help us meet our climate commitments, much more still needs to be done if we are to ensure the necessary mix of renewables and particularly storage technology that our economy and society will require over the coming de uh, decades? And what plans does he have in that regard 
building on the strong signal sent out by today's statement. Yes. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I welcome uh, Liam MacArthur's uh, positive remarks around the decision we've taken today, although I would describe a scenic route as being one which is involving the people of Scotland and key stakeholders in reaching what I regard as a considered position and a robust one. But on his uh, point around renewables and storage, I very much recognise that is a very strong part of where we want to go in this, in this country. We are continuing to press uh, UK ministers, as I know uh, Mr MacArthur is aware, for supportive decisions around uh, remote island wind projects on the islands and indeed interconnection between the islands and the mainland and also in terms of investment in pumped hydro storage and other forms of grid scale storage to allow us to have a truly sustainable energy future for Scotland. I want to say more on that, presiding officer, but in way of time today, uh, we will of course put uh, full detail into our finalised energy strategy which we'll publish in December and I hope it will be one that, that Mr MacArthur and his colleagues can support. Angus MacDonald to be followed by John Scott. Angus MacDonald. Thank you, uh, President Officer. I, I warmly welcome the Minister's announcement this afternoon, as will the majority of my constituents in Falkirk East, and I also welcome the cautious evidence-led approach taken by the Scottish Government. Given that fracking is to be effectively banned, a uh, subject, of course, to the, the forthcoming debate and vote in Parliament, which will give, uh, the ban will give residents throughout central Scotland peace of mind, can the Minister give me an assurance that the Government will remain focused on ensuring industry and Grangemouth is supported and encouraged, whilst bearing in mind that that industry and Grangemouth sits cheek by jowl with the 18,000 residents of the port, not to mention the wider population in Falkirk District? Minister. Uh, well, I, I certainly recognise the points that Mr Macdonald has raised about the importance of uh, listening to community views in, in his area in Falkirk, but also bearing in mind the important future for the chemicals, uh, chemical industry in Scotland. Regardless of our position, I've tried to make clear in the statement, regardless of our position on conventional oil and gas in Scotland, our support for Scotland's industrial base and manufacturing is unwavering. Uh, manufacturing and industry continue to play a crucial role in the Scottish economy, as I've set out. We understand that, as I said in my statement, that a supportive fiscal regime costs of energy, access to right skills and improving the infrastructure for the sector are all essential for the sector to remain competitive and we will work with UK government colleagues as well in respect of the, the industrial strategy and making sure that any sector deals are, are supportive of investment in Scotland. But we have taken steps already to support energy intensive industries in terms of their uh, maintaining the competitiveness, uh, competitiveness in regard to energy costs and I give the member a reassurance that we will work very, very closely with key employers in his constituency. Uh, I just want to finish on, on, on reflecting the fact there were 393 substantive responses from uh, people in Falkirk in addition to petition and campaign responses. So uh, Mr Macdonald can be very, uh, very comforted, comforted that the, his constituents played an active role in, in submitting to the consultation. John Scott to be followed by Gillian Martin. John Scott. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Cabinet Secretary, the announcement of a ban today is a massive slap in the face to Scottish academia engineers, geologists, industry experts and many more highly skilled individuals who have been dealt a heavy blow here today. In a can-do Scotland, known worldwide for its pioneering technologies, safely and responsibility, what kind of message does the Cabinet Secretary think he is sending out to those in these areas of academia and scientific research and those who work in the industry and whose jobs who have now been put at risk, as well as those who could have been attracted to Scotland to work in this new industry. Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Well, I would say to John Scott that um, a, in response to his points, we have taken a cautious and evidence-based approach to this issue. UK government pressed on in a gung-ho fashion, caring not for the views of communities and areas that are affected by unconventional oil and gas. We have taken a different approach. We have listened to industry. I've set out today both the, the pros and cons of unconventional oil and gas and the fact that we've had to take a balanced decision based on looking at the needs of our environment, our important commitments around climate change and indeed uh, the views of local communities. But we are very mindful of the impact uh, of uh, all decisions government takes on, on business and we've taken very seriously the views that have been represented by business. He characterises our, our approach to this as being irresponsible. I would suggest that we have done anything but being irresponsible. We've taken a very responsible approach to this issue. We have considered and we have listened and we have reflected that 13 areas of the country who are most likely to be uh, involved in unconventional oil and gas activity do not support this activity. And it's very important that the views of the people of Scotland are taken into account. And I would encourage Mr Scott, on behalf of his constituents, which are in an area of the country which is also under the Great Midland Valley, uh, to consider very carefully his remarks today. Gillian Martin, to be followed by Claire Baker. Gillian Martin. Thank you, President Officer. 
Well, it's a clear statement of intent when it comes to unconventional oil and gas practices in Scotland. Looking at the conventional practices of our domestic oil and gas industry of great importance to the people in my area, what continuing support would the Scottish Government give to the sector to get people into work? Minister. Well, um, Julian Martin raises a very important point. Um, I, I, I've referred to it in my statement, but we do very strongly support the oil and gas industry uh, and, and its offshore activities. We have jointly funded with the UK Government a £180 million oil and gas technology centre and indeed the innovation hub for that centre was launched yesterday by the First Minister. We have put in place the Energy Jobs Task Force which has focused on improving the resilience of oil and gas companies both in the production sector and the supply chain. We have invested up to £10 million in R&D support to help oil and gas supply chain companies to improve their performance and remain competitive and we have helped those oil and gas industry workers affected by redundancy through the Transition Training Fund with £12 million of support, helping two, more than 2,400 individuals directly and providing a further 755 uh, places through two procurement rounds. And our energy strategy makes clear, very clear that there is a long-term role for the sector, even though we are embarked on a, an ambitious low-carbon uh, trajectory. And I very much uh, add my own support and those of my colleagues to the oil and gas industry. This government has been strong champions of the sector in Scotland, and you can judge us on our record in that respect. Claire Baker to be followed by Graeme Day. Claire Baker. Um, I have been campaigning for action against fracking across my region since 2012 and I've taken opportunities to raise my constituents' concerns in the Chamber, so thank you to the President Officer for calling me. The Minister spoke about the need for a strategic environmental assessment before the finalisation of this decision. Can he tell the Chamber when he expects this to be completed? Minister. Well, the, the member raised a very important point because any key decisions like this do require, under the 2005 Act, we re require to provide a strategic environmental assessment, and we will embark on that as soon as we possibly can. It is likely to overlap the production of the final uh, energy strategy in December, but we will obviously reflect that uh, position that it's not yet been finalised uh, in, in the, the final energy strategy when we publish it. But it is an important process. It may take uh, many months, of course, uh, to consult widely with industry and st key stakeholders, but I assure the member we'll, we will move on it as fast as we possibly can and I recognise her long-standing interest in this issue and hope she welcomes uh, the announcement today. Graeme Day to be followed by Jamie Green. Uh, thank you. The Scottish Government has consistently stated that unless it could be proved beyond any doubt that there was no risk to health, communities or the environment from fracking, then such activity would not take place in Scotland. Could the Minister provide some clarity on where in reaching this very welcome decision it was determined that risks remained? Minister. Well, the, the key areas uh, I've, I've summarised in my uh, statement, but uh, to give more detail around climate emissions, we obviously are, have a very uh, stringent, uh, st legally binding annual statutory targets on climate change, which are, as I'm sure the member is well aware, uh, difficult enough to, to, to meet. And we are setting out our plans through the climate change plan to deliver those up to 2032. Um, the KPMG study indicated that in the central production scenario, depending on the degree of regulation there would be, and assuming that there would be a uh, good level of regulation by uh, our outstanding uh, uh, environmental agencies such as SEPA, between 0.4 megatons of CO2 to 0.6 megatons of CO2 emissions might be expected annually uh, in, in, in addition to those emissions we already produce in the Scottish economy. In addition, um, health impacts, uh, there was inconclusive data in terms of the, uh, the evidence on long-term uh, epidemiological impacts of, of this new industry. And in terms of communities, clearly, as I've set out, there was a very strong sentiment that there was a lack of a social licence to take forward industry at this time. And uh, that has led us to put in place uh, the position I've outlined today. Jamie Green to be followed by Bruce Crawford. Jamie Green. Uh, presenting officer, the minister talks about social licence, but this government spent a decade overturning local decisions on wind farms. There was no social licence for that, yeah. but it was deemed in the national interest. But now, with a budget just weeks away, it is buckling under political pressure and forfeiting the economic boost that fracking might bring Scotland. So can I ask the minister, is this the new way of doing government, where national policy is led by opinion polls rather than economic and scientific evidence even evidence its own panel gave them. Scotland needs a government which does the right thing, not the populist thing. Minister. Well, um, presiding officer, that was, that was an interesting tirade um, from our colleagues across the Conservative benches. Um, it's ironic, given the, the remarks that have just been made, that um, Michael Gove, in his speech to the Conservative Conference, I don't normally pay attention to these things, but it was drawn, drawn to my attention. 
Now, Michael Gove has said that uh, the Conservative Party are indeed are instinctive defenders of beauty in the landscape, protectors of wildlife, friends of the earth. I'm sure Richard Dixon might disagree with that. <laughs> the first and still most ambitious Green Party in this country is a Conservative Party. I, I beg to differ. He went on to say that uh, chance to secure a special prize, a green Brexit. I thought there was a red, white and blue Brexit that Theresa May was wanting. But on the other hand, we are, in all sincerity, we take very seriously the concerns of communities in regards to wind farm applications. As the members should know, uh, planning decisions are taken uh, in response to uh, such applications in a quasi-judicial process. Each application is judged on its merits and uh, often informed by uh, the very expert opinion of reporters in the DPEA. Um, these are not uh, political decisions, that, as he characterises them, and uh, we take very sincerely our responsibilities to communities, and we have reformed Scottish planning policy in the lifetime of this government to take greater account of cumulative impact and protect key landscapes such as the national scenic areas and national parks. So I, I, I do not agree with the premise of Mr Green's remarks and I would th say that we stand on our record in terms of renewable energy which is driving economic growth, sustainable low carbon economic growth in this country and something which is contributing strongly to the UK government's own targets for renewable energy. Bruce Crawford. Thank you, President Officer. Can I say I very much welcome the ban announced by the Government today. This could not have been an easy decision-making process for the Minister and I recognise his courage in taking this step. Can I ask the Scottish Government, throughout its consideration of unconventional oil and gas extraction, how they take into account public opinion in Scotland, including in particular the concerns of those in my constituency of Stirling? I cannot wait to read the Conservative Party's Dean, Lock Dean Lock Lockhart's pro-fracking comments in the Stirling Observer. Minister. Yes, uh, I, I certainly will enjoy reading uh, the reaction to Mr Lockhart's remarks in the Stirling Observer. Um, I, I think um, Mr Crawford makes a very important point. As a, a very assiduous um, constituency member, I know he is, uh, he will be aware that, that we issued an open, inclusive consultation over a period of four months, ending in, in May, as I outlined in my statement. And uh, we tried to ensure, as best we possibly could, that as many uh, individuals could take part. We launched a, a dedicated uh, website, mini website, to uh, host all the um, material for the consultation. We uh, directed people to packs which could be used for local community groups to have local meetings. I'm delighted that over 180 uh, community organisations took part in the consultation, many of them community councils and many of them in areas that were affected, which I think uh, reflects very well in the Parliament in terms of our engagement with the communities of Scotland on this issue. And I can say to, to the member that um, over 200, um, or 200 sorry, uh, substantive responses were received from residents within Stirling area. In addition, again, as I said to Mr. Macdonald to those who took part in petitions and took part in the campaign email uh, campaigns as well. So I, I do believe that residents in Stirling were actively involved and I very much welcome and thank them for their participation. Thank you very much. Apologies to Emma Harper and Donald Cameron and other members who may wish to have been called. That concludes this statement. There will be another chance to, I, I imagine, discuss this in the immediate future. We will now move on to a statement on education and we will just take a few moments to change seats. <laughs>